Hi everyone, I started to make a video today about how the Leaning Tower of Pisa came to be in its current form and what has happened over its history from a geotechnical engineering standpoint, but I felt like, you know, that topic's been done several times before. So I was kind of thinking back to some comments that many of you made regarding the Millennium Tower, or some people refer to it as the Leaning Tower of San Francisco, and I thought it might be interesting to compare the two geotechnical situations for each building, point out what they have in common, as well as what's different, and just approach it from a more technical basis. But I think it's something that you all might enjoy here. So the Leaning Tower of Pisa obviously is in Pisa, Italy. Uh, construction was initiated in 1173 AD, and they worked on it for about five years, and they realized that the tower was starting to tilt already only after completing about one third of the planned 183 foot height of the tower. So they took some time off, waited for the settlement to stabilize or the movement. So it was almost another 100 years before they resumed construction. Overall, the tower took 200 years to complete with intervening wars, uh, periods where they were waiting for additional settlement and tilting to stabilize. But the tower has withstood the test of time. So this tower in Pisa is the bell tower associated with a Catholic cathedral. Many of these towers that were built in medieval Italy were done so by rich patrons who wanted to show off their status. These towers also served for offensive and defensive military purposes. I fart in your gender direction. And you can see that this structure is quite ornate. So you have inner and outer walls made of marble and the gap between the walls called the annular space was filled with stones and gravel. So here's a Google Earth shot of this general location of where the Leaning Tower of Pisa is located. So let's pull out here a little bit and look at a broader map of Italy. We see that Pisa is in the northwest corner of the country. The site that's now occupied by the Leaning Tower of Pisa used to be marshland. So an area just behind, say, a shoreline in the flats where you get tidal fluctuations. You also could have nearby rivers that flow to the ocean and periodically flood and deposit sand, silt, clay materials in the marsh area. This is what the soil profile looks like for the Leaning Tower. You can see the foundation extends approximately three meters below the ground surface. And the soil profile, again, is made up of sandy and clay silts. You have sand layers, you have clay layers. So in such a depositional environment, you would expect a lot of variation in not only the thickness, but also the type of materials from one location to the next. And this is exactly what led to the problems with the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So what type of geotechnical mechanisms are involved with causing the Leaning Tower to lean? Well, it's a localized bearing capacity failure. And bearing capacity is the ability of soil to withstand a load imposed by a foundation due to the stresses imposed by the overlying structure. Now, if you take relatively weak and compressible materials and you quickly load them, they'll have what's called an undrained shear strength. And these undrained strengths can often be quite low. And so when you apply the load, these pore pressures increase, reducing the available strength along the potential shear surface, and you have the weight of the structure as a driving force that causes a zone of soil to move in what's been termed a logarithmic spiral, that type of shape. And uh, you'll have downward movement, downward displacement. You'll have some translation at the base, which leads to tilt at the top of the structure. And you'll often have a low area on one side where the soil has moved downward and a high area where it's pushed up. So what can be done is if you realize you're having some amount of bearing capacity failure and it hasn't led to a catastrophic or general bearing capacity failure, you could reduce the load or certainly stop applying additional load. And that's what the builders, the original builders of the Leaning Tower of Pisa did. They waited. And what happens when you have fine grain materials that have excess pore water pressures built up due to increased stress from an overlying load, given enough time, the water between the soil particles will drain away and you'll approach a higher strength for that soil layer. Here's an example of a bearing capacity failure. This was for a grain elevator in Canada that failed in 1913. 
And in this instance, there was an adequate appreciation for the variability of the subsurface profile, and they didn't understand that there was a much softer, weaker clay layer at a lower depth in the soil profile. But it was within the zone of soil that would experience additional loading from the overlying silos. Obviously, the uh, Italians in the Middle Ages didn't have access to geotechnical drill rigs like you see here. So I'm going to go through a few more technical details and then I'm going to start comparing and contrasting the situation with the Millennium Tower and the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Now, when people in the Middle Ages built structures, they relied on their experience, essentially a empirical design. So if they built something that worked, didn't fall down, and stood the test of time, they would build the exact type of structure again. And for the Pisa Tower, it was quite common to have three meter or 10 foot deep foundations. Now, the bearing capacity increases with increasing depth of your foundation. So key aspects of bearing capacity are the characteristics of the subsurface profile, particularly the shear strength, the undrained shear strength, the location where the load is applied, that is the depth of the footing or foundation, and also the amount of loading and the rate of loading. So if you're relying on empirical design methods and you're not aware of differences in the subsurface profile, it could lead to a problem, which is exactly what happened here. Now, for the Millennium Tower, empirically, other tall buildings had been built in this area of San Francisco successfully. However, the designers apparently didn't appreciate the fact that the Millennium Tower was going to be a much heavier structure. The Tower of Pisa weighs 14,500 tons. The Millennium Tower, which was made of reinforced concrete, weighs over 343,000 tons. And that was the key difference here with the Millennium Tower. Other tall structures have been built in this area of San Francisco, but they were steel frame structures, which are much lighter than a reinforced concrete structure. In fact, this letter from Lawrence Karp, I've mentioned him in previous videos. He's a geotechnical engineer local to the Bay Area with over 40 years of experience. He pointed out in this memo that the Millennium Tower was one of the heaviest reinforced concrete structures located on the entire west coast of the United States. Now let's look at a soil profile here at Millennium Tower. You've got alluvial sands and clays. The piling typically extended about 80 feet below the grade to a sand layer, the Coloma sand. And below that you have the Old Bay clay deposits, which are susceptible to consolidation and do settlement if you impose a new load, either by building a heavy structure over the top of it or lowering the groundwater level, which again increases the effective stress. So anything that you do that increases the effective stress on a soil layer is going to cause some amount of settlement, whether it's elastic or if it's great enough, it'll cause what's called primary settlement or consolidation settlement. Also, you can see from the nearby Salesforce Tower, those foundations went all the way to bedrock. So with the Tower of Pisa, as I mentioned, they knew, the builders, that uh, there were problems with settlement and tilting during construction. So in 2009, as the Millennium Tower was nearing its completion, the design engineer, the foundation engineer, was brought in to evaluate why total measured settlement was on the order of 10 inches when only four and a half inches had been predicted by this design engineer over the full lifetime of the building, which was in excess of 50 years. So let's go back to the foundation loading mechanism. The foundation's on 960 concrete pile driven to that sand layer, the Coloma sand. Anyone who's seen a geotechnical engineering book in college or, or elsewhere is probably familiar with Terzaghi's equivalent raft foundation design methodology. And that is, if you have a large number of closely spaced pile extending to some depth below the ground surface, that layer where the piles tip out could be considered as one big mat. And that's the point where your stresses are applied. And you can see this stress bulb, it's a classic Buzan-esque stress bulb where you have the highest stresses near the top that decay with depth. And the angle, if you project the influence of that stress bulb, it's at about a two to one angle from the sides. Here's the settlement plot for the Millennium Tower with total settlement 
maximum uh, to date close to 18 or 19 inches. Now, going back to this Lawrence Carp letter, he pointed out that not only was this one of the heaviest buildings consisting of reinforced concrete on the entire West Coast, it was of similar height and loading for a nearby building at 80 Natoma Street. And uh, unlike the Millennium Tower, 80 Natoma, that geotechnical foundation report had an independent reviewer assess the viability of that foundation type. And they determined that a shallow foundation for 80 Natoma was gonna be wholly inadequate due to excessive settlements. And this was done in 2004, this independent evaluation, just as construction was beginning to start for the Millennium Tower. And as we know, if you've been following my past videos, the city of San Francisco granted the building permit for Millennium Tower, even though uh, construction was not approved for 80 Natoma. So again, going back to empirical design methodology, why didn't anybody say, hey, if it wouldn't work for this building down the street of similar size and configuration on a shallow foundation, why would it work for the Millennium Tower? Again, these are the types of data sources that the Italians in medieval Europe didn't have the luxury of, of knowing about. So what's common to both structures, both towers, if you will, is the fact that the amount of settlement and tilt increased following efforts to quote, repair what had happened to the foundation for these structures. In the 1800s, a repair attempt involved excavating soil on one side tower, and it was observed that the amount of settlement or tilting was greatly increasing, so they stopped what they were doing. So in 1990, the building tilt reached its maximum of five and a half degrees from the vertical. Now with the Millennium Tower, it only has 0.2 degrees of deflection at the top. So that's not the type of deflection for the Millennium Tower that could be observed with the naked eye. So in the 90s, they realized that the Pisa Tower was in a state of imminent collapse. So they quickly installed lead counterweights on the high side of the foundation to try and prevent further deflection. This isn't unlike uh, the counterweights that's used on the back of a crane to balance the weight of the crane boom and whatever loads being picked up. So throughout the 90s, really from 1993 to 2001, the Italian government contracted to have more proactive stabilization measures uh, installed. And they did that by drilling directional holes that remove soil from one portion of the, the uphill side, if you will, of the Pisa Tower and by extracting the auger after it had drilled underneath the tower, soil was allowed to move into the void left from this auger. And uh, in this fashion, they controlled reversal of some of the tilt back to four degrees. And of course, at the time, people were concerned that they were going to fully straighten the Tower of Pisa, which would have killed tourism. And of course, that wasn't gonna happen. So the idea was to stabilize it, and apparently the stability is such that they don't expect any problems for another two or 300 years. So going back to the Millennium Tower, they had a plan to install 54 perimeter piling, and because they were having much more settlement and tilting of the building during the installation of these pile, which involved installing a casing, removing soil from within the casing, and then installing a pile full depth to the bedrock. And what the repair engineers failed to appreciate is that removing the soil was going to increase the amount of settlement and associated building tilt. And I think the design engineer was rather disingenuous when he said, well, he didn't address that because that's the contractor's problem, the, the contractor doing the repair work. And I completely disagree with that viewpoint. I was involved with the railroad bridge project this bridge originally was constructed in the late 1800s, and it was a masonry pier. And they, well, how they built it was they lashed together a bunch of tree branches in, to form a, a mat. And then they started the course of masonry to form the perimeter of the wall, and they put some number of courses uh, on this mat 
and fill the interior typically with uh, coarse rock or boulders and cobbles. And the weight of the masonry and the infill would push this raft, this br uh, pallet, if you will, of lashed together branches deeper into the sand in the channel for the river where the bridge was located. So here we come along, uh, the contractor I was working with had the job of installing deep foundations, uh, drill shaft foundations to rock, but very close to these existing mat foundations that were embedded only about 30 feet into the river channel. And so you can bet the design engineer for the new bridge specified that not only did the existing bridge have to be monitored, but that excessive vibrations, and they, and they specified the limits, had to be strictly observed. So again, with the Millennium Tower, I strongly believe that the engineers involved with the repair effort should have been more proactive about what types of performance could be permitted relative to the installation of the quote repair measures. And they just, they just took a powder on it. And then, if, you know, fortunately they were closely monitoring uh, with instrumentation and, and realized a significant amount of increase in building settlement and tilt occurred after they started installing these perimeter piling. And so as a result, they curtailed their program from 54 piles to 18 piles. And so this perimeter piling, these 18 pile, were connected to an extension of the mat foundation, which reminds me of the Pisa Tower. This was one of the mistakes that was made throughout the years when they were attempting to do some type of repair work is they started removing the pathway or the sidewalk adjacent to one side of the tower and movement again was increasing and then they realized that that walkway was actually bearing some of the foundation load. So it was a structural element. It wasn't merely a nice surface to walk on. Here's a plot of the building tilt and you can see this is the point where they started doing their installation of the perimeter piling. So they greatly increased the amount of building tilt to 29 inches from about 15 at the start of this repair effort. And in a similar fashion, the amount of foundation settlement drastically increased. So another commonality that the Tower of Pisa and Millennium Tower have is that they're both in earthquake country. Of course, there was a devastating earthquake in 1906 in San Francisco that leveled the city. Of course, the main earthquake hazard to San Francisco comes from the San Andreas Fault. Here's a seismic hazard map of Italy, and you can see the dots here representing various earthquakes over, over the years. And uh, the reason why Italy is so active tectonically in terms of earthquakes and volcanoes is because of the collision between the African and European continental plates. Here's an overview of some of the past earthquakes that occurred in Italy. In 1915, 32,000 people were killed during a magnitude 7 earthquake in central Italy. In 1930, a 6.5 magnitude quake killed around 1,400 people. In 1976, a 6.5 magnitude earthquake killed nearly 1,000 people and left 70,000 others without homes. And uh, most recently in 1980, 2,700 people were killed and 7,500 injured an earthquake measuring against 6.5. So the Tower of Pisa has withstood many fairly large earthquakes in its 600 plus years of existence and has withstood the test of time. Now, unfortunately with the Millennium Tower, there's a lot of concern. There are a lot of structural and geotechnical engineers that are very familiar with uh, the Millennium Tower project who have grave concerns about how well the Millennium Tower would perform during an earthquake. So I think it's rather ironic that it seems that the seismic stability of a 652-year-old tower that's tilting four degrees uh, may be more certain than a modern multi-story residential high-rise that was just completed in 2009 with only 0.28 degrees of tilt. Now, another commonality between the Tower of Pisa and the Millennium Tower is, at least for the repair effort for the Pisa Tower, and well, I guess the repair efforts for both structures, sophisticated computer modeling was employed. 
finite element analysis to model, model soil behavior, how the applied loads would affect the subsurface soils in terms of issues with exceeding available shear strength or causing excessive settlement. In the case of Millennium Tower, uh, they modeled the earthquake response. The problem with numerical modeling is that you have to make a lot of assumptions in order to do a calculation because you can never know all the things you need to know. So there's more unknowns than knowns. So the simplifying assumptions are made in order to complete an analysis. So both structures, the Millennium Tower and the Tower of Pisa, are closely monitored on an ongoing basis to make sure that settlement and deflection rates don't start increasing. Of course, the Tower of Pisa is world famous and is a major tourist attraction that brings lots of money to the country of Italy. Unfortunately for Millennium Tower, the money is being spent and not made. You know, the unit owners are having a hard time selling their units. There's a question about how much additional repair work may have to be done in the future. There's even a question at what point will someone have to pay to have that building taken down if the seismic performance can't be assured. So I want to give a shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate your all support. I also appreciate those of you who have uh, left comments and liked these videos, as well as subscribed to the channel. If you'd like your free digital download of the biggest civil engineering disasters for the past hundred years, check out the link in the description. Thanks very much, everyone.